It's a real pleasure to be here and to present uh, the work I've been doing over the last uh, five years or so, um, since my PhD. Um, so genuinely, I want you to try and understand as much as you can. So it's not the easiest material, and especially when you don't have a background in neuroscience, it's not always uh, that easy to, to get a handle on these processes. Uh, but I'm going to do my absolute best to try and help you understand, and I'll provide some metaphors to try and break things down and make them more accessible. So we'll see how we go. Also, it, it'll be useful to, to keep some pens out because there'll be some references. If genuinely you do want to understand how these drugs work in the brain, then it does require a bit of work on your part as well, unfortunately. So you'd have to go away and look up some of these references and do some back, background reading. So I just want to start by saying that this work is part of the Beckley Imperial uh, Psychedelic Research Program, which is an initiative uh, between uh, David Nutt and Amanda Fielding of the Beckley Foundation. Amanda's a, you know, a key collaborative partner in this work, and David Nutt's the principal investigator on it. So we'll start with the science. We know that psilocybin's an ingredient in magic mushrooms. Uh, now, psilocybin is the prodrug of psilocin, which is remarkably similar in its molecular structure to the endogenous neurotransmitter, which is found throughout the brain, serotonin. So it's really quite striking how similar it is in its molecular, st molecular structure. And just a subtle change in its, uh, in its structure confers such profound effects on consciousness. So th this already is, is, is a matter of, of great intrigue about how these drugs work in the brain. So what was found in the mid-80s was this uh, strong positive correlation between a psychedelic drug's affinity for the serotonin 2A receptor, a particular subtype uh, uh, of, the, of the serotonin receptor, and the drug's potency. So a good uh, example to help illustrate this principle is that LSD has a very high affinity for the serotonin 2A receptor. It's very sticky, and it's also incredibly potent. So that helps you understand. Uh, also, the uh, Franz Vollenweider did a excellent study blocking the serotonin 2A receptor with catanserin, relatively selective serotonin 2A receptor blocker, and he found that pretreatment with this drug blocked the psychedelic effects of psilocybin. So there's good evidence that these drugs trigger their effects on consciousness by an initial effect on the serotonin to A receptor. So already we have a, a, an important fundamental uh, relationship there that's been discovered between the serotonin system and how these drugs work in the brain. So where is the serotonin to A receptor in the brain? Well, this is the largest uh, serotonin to A uh, binding study that's been done by a colleague of ours, David Arizzo. So he used a, uh, a radioactive tracer or ligand that sticks to serotonin 2A receptors in the brain. And then you can detect the signal from where the ligand is stuck. And so doing this, he found that the serotonin 2A receptor is very much a cortical receptor. So the outer layer of the brain, the cortex, the, the, it's referred to as uh, the, the kind of bark, you know, like the bark, bark of a tree. Uh, so this outer layer of the brain, that's where you find the serotonin 2A receptor. And it's especially prevalent, it's especially densely expressed in high-level cortical regions. So these are regions that, that don't have a specific sensory function, like, for instance, the visual cortex, which is concerned with visual processing. They're heteromodal regions, so they have a more kind of divergent and higher-level function. And so the serotonin 2A receptor is especially densely expressed in these high-level cortical regions, such as the posterior cingulate cortex, You'll hear this term referred to again throughout my talk because it's a key region of the brain, a very high level region of the brain, and it seems to be especially implicated in the mechanism of action of these drugs, how they work in the brain. We also know that the serotonin 2A receptor is especially densely expressed in a particular layer of the cortex. So the cortex is organized in a kind of laminar uh, way, and uh, there's some large, uh, what are referred to as pyramidal neurons in layer five of the cortex. That's, uh, let's see how my pointer works. Uh, let's see. This is layer five here. So there's some large neurons there. And these are the 
principal output. This is a principal output layer of the cortex. And there's also something else which is especially important about this, this uh, cellular group uh, in terms of how the drug works in the brain. So we know, where the serotonin, we know that the serotonin wave receptor is important. We know where it is, both in terms of uh, its spatial distribution in the brain and also within the cortex itself, within its laminar organization. It's, it's dense in the uh, deep pyramidal cells of layer five. We also know that if you stimulate the serotonin 2A receptor, you have a excitatory effect on the host cell. So the, the cell that expresses the receptor, if you stimulate it, then you're going to make that cell more excitable. So these are all important principles that we know. These are kind of the, the sort of bedrock uh, findings so far about how psychedelics work in the brain. But these are all quite low level and my brain imaging work has been looking at a, a higher level, what's referred to as a, a macro, macroscopic level, so the level that you can sort of look at, you know, and see on a, on a, on a large scale in terms of brain networks, for instance, uh, and regional brain activity. So let's start with our first uh, study, our first fMRI study with psilocybin. This used the modality uh, referred to as arterial spin labeling, which is a method which uh, measures changes in blood flow in the brain. And generally there's quite a reliable relationship between blood flow in the brain and brain activity. So if blood flow increases, we generally infer that brain activity is increased. So this study had 15 healthy volunteers, mean age of 34. The scans were 18 minutes in duration. There was a six minute baseline. And then we looked at changes in blood flow after that baseline. There was two scans, a placebo scan followed by the drug scan. And volunteers just lay in the scanner. They were presented with a fixation cross, just a simple green, green cross that they looked at uh, on a screen. And they just relaxed and, and were instructed really just to let their minds wander. And then we looked at how the drug affected blood flow during these conditions. We gave a dose of two milligrams of psilocybin. That compares to about 50 milligrams when given orally, we gave the drug intravenously, so two milligrams is equivalent to about 15 milligrams given orally, so it's a moderate dose. Here's the design, here's our six minute baseline. The infusion was given over 60 seconds, so it's a relatively rapid infusion. And then the onset of the effects is also rapid, so when the drug's given intravenously, really there's very little delay between delivery of the drug and the onset of the subjective effects. So they be the subjective effects actually begin uh, really before the end of the 60 second administration. So the drug seems to really get in the brain very quickly uh, and to change consciousness profoundly very quickly. So what was the first observation? Well, the first thing that we get before we analyze the results are people's descriptions of their experiences. So here's one of them. This volunteer said that there was a definite sense of lubrication, of freedom, of the cogs being loosened and firing off in all sorts of unexpected directions. Now these subjective reports are really useful because they give you a sense of the uh, mechanics that are going on in the brain and the, change, the changes in, in the mechanics which uh, confer the subjective effects. You know, what's going on in the brain on a mechanical level to, to produce the, cha the profound changes in consciousness. This volunteer said everything became fragmented Things were all in bits, and it was very hard to hold it all together in a coherent stream. So like I said, this stuff's really useful for understanding what's going on on a uh, systems level in the brain to produce these subjective effects. Now the default mode network you've heard quite a lot about over the last two days. Uh, it's an incredibly important um, system that's been discovered in the brain. Uh, and one of its properties is that it has very dense connectivity. So if you look at the, the white matter tracks in the brain, so these are the fibers that connect different brain regions, then you'll find that there's a very dense coming together of connections within the default mode network. So it seems to be a, an incredibly important transit hub, so a place that uh, different regions can connect via uh, and information can be projected from and also a very important integration center. So to integrate brain function, information comes together in this common convergence zone, and then that gives a coherence to uh, 
cognition, essentially. That's how it's understand so far. That's how it's understood so far. What else about the default mode network? So here's a metaphor to help you try and understand uh, what people are thinking about its function. So a metaphor that could be used to explain what it does is a capital city in a country. So it's, it's, it's a place where people come together, things come together, business gets done, uh, and it's an incredibly important hub. And if ever, God forbid, something was to happen to London, uh, then uh, the country as a whole would be uh, seriously affected, and not just uh, Britain. But, uh, so it's an incre incredibly important sort of integration hub, the default mode network. What else do we know about the default mode network? So some evidence is here. The default mode network undergoes significant ontogenetic development, so from infancy to adulthood. It undergoes maturation as cognition matures. It's also undergone significant evolutionary expansion, so these regions have increased more than other regions, from primates to humans. It's more metabolically active than elsewhere in the brain, so the posterior cingulate cortex, which is that region circled there, it actually accounts for 40% uh, more blood flow than anywhere else in the brain. So it's a very metabolically hungry system, and these regions that are part of it are incredibly metabolically hungry. You know, It's doing something important. Now, what's uh, kind of a, a sort of matter of intrigue in neuroscience is that people don't really have a, a good handle on what the default mode is and what it does, but they, of course, enjoy speculating. And the uh, researcher who um, really discovered the default mode network has referred to its very high um, energy levels as being uh, like the brain's dark energy. So similar to dark energy in cosmology, it's something that we know is there, but we don't really know what it does. Really, we, ma we make inferences about it based on its uh, relative decrease in activity. So when you engage in a task, you see a, a decrease in activity in the default mode network, whereas otherwise it's incredibly active. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of intrigue. What's, what's going on here? You know, what's all this energy for and why is it consuming so much? We know that the default mode network is engaged during self-reflection, so that's a very staple finding. We also know that during complex mental imagery, so, such as spatial navigation or, or imagination, fantasy in one's mind's eye, uh, that you'll also see increased uh, activity in the default mode network. Mental time travel, so that's being outside of the moment and daydreaming about future events or um, past autobiographical experiences. So whenever you come out of the moment and you, you daydream in this way, you see increased uh, activity and connectivity in the default mode network. Also theory of mind, which is putting oneself in somebody else's shoes, you also see increased activity in the default mode network during that function. And metacognition, which is uh, thinking about thinking, that's also linked with default mode network activity. So Rachel, who I said was the guy who really discovered this network, has also referred to it as the orchestrator of the self. So all these things uh, led me to start thinking, having a background in, in psychoanalysis and being interested especially in Freudian metapsychology, so the more kind of mechanistic ideas of Freud. Uh, there's remarkable overlap between his descriptions of the ego and the relationship between the ego and the unconscious mind or the id and what we're discovering about the default mode network. So in this paper uh, with Carl Friston, I, I submitted the idea that the uh, default mode network is essentially the neural substrates of, of the ego, which is an idea to be shot down if, uh, if people find uh, otherwise, but that's science, that's how we work. So what else about the default mode network? Well, what's its relationship to depression? There's a very interesting relationship between default mode network parameters and uh, depressive symptomatology. So we know that connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex of the default mode network and the posterior cingulate cortex, which are, how's my pointer doing? Not very well, uh, thanks. Which are the, cheers, the front bits and the back bits there. Um, so when connectivity between these regions is high, then scores in patients with depression on rumination, so these are scores of rumination, so thinking over your problems and, and ruminating on negative things, 
when this is high, connectivity between these regions is, is especially high. And we think that this, is, this system and this, this kind of over-connectivity is really causing people to um, have a kind of stereotyped style of, of thinking. So they're stuck, they're stuck in this system, they're stuck in their own heads, and they're stuck on their, on their uh, sense of self, you know. They're usually thinking very critically about themselves and going over and over uh, about how terrible they are, you know. So this is a relationship that we seem to be discovering about the default mode network and depressive symptomatology. So this provides a useful background for what we're finding in terms of how psilocybin is affecting uh, brain networks and brain systems. So in our ASL study, we found uh, it was really quite a surprising finding for us, um, you know, given descriptions of consciousness being expanded by psychedelic drugs. We, uh, given uh, some previous work, for instance, by Franz Vollenweider, we were thinking that we were going to see increases in brain activity or brain blood flow with psilocybin. And uh, despite dropping the threshold and a number of different things, we really didn't see this. And all we were seeing was the same pattern again and again, which was decreased blood flow in certain regions of the brain. So what was intriguing was that the decreases that we were seeing were in, in these very same important hub structures of the brain. So for instance, the posterior cingulate cortex, this bit at the back, uh, the thalamus, and the medial prefrontal cortex. So these very reliably were coming up as being decreased under psilocybin. Here's a, just showing you again that the default mode network is this kind of hub, this connectivity hub in the brain. We also found that there was a relationship between the magnitude of the decreases in blood flow and ratings of the intensity of the experience. So the larger the decreases in blood flow, particularly in the anterior cingulate cortex, the more intense people were describing their experiences. So whenever you find these relationships, it, it kind of reinforces your inferences, inferences really, and, and provides some, uh, some consolidation for, for what you're finding and sort of uh, supports its functional meaning, you know. Uh, so since our ASL study, we did a bold study. This is kind of the classic uh, signal of functional magnetic resonance imaging. And we really repeated the same protocol, 15 healthy volunteers infused with the drug over 60 seconds, two milligrams, and we found exactly the same thing. So this was really nice reinforcement uh, for the initial finding that we'd found with ASL. And these are regions where there was a common overlap between the decreases in blood flow with ASL and the decreases in essentially venous oxygenation or oxygenated blood with the bold signal of, of fMRI. So one of the merits of bold fMRI is it allows you to do these functional connectivity analyses. So just to give you a feel for what, what that is, uh, here's an image which shows the default mode network in orange. And let's concentrate on the default mode network for a moment. So you can see that there's two regions in it, and there's one that has um, yellow text, the PCC, and then you can see this time series underneath. So the PCC time series is in yellow, and you can see that it overlaps with another time series, and that's the medial prefrontal cortex. So it's by looking at correlations between fluctuations in the bold signal that we identify functionally coherent brain networks. And we know that these regions work together as a common network doing a common function by finding that their activity is essentially synchronous. What we also see is that there's another time series here in blue, and this time series seems to have a kind of competitive or anti-phase relationship with the default mode regions. This will become important as we go on because this anti-phase or competitive relationship between different networks seems to be important as well in terms of how psilocybin works in the brain. But let's first look at uh, sort of within network functional connectivity and how psilocybin affects that. So here's uh, a hippocampal functional connectivity analysis. Uh, you may have heard Luke Williams present some of this work. So he, he uh, was very helpful doing a lot of the analyses on this uh, project. So here's the, default, here's the uh, hippocampus seed in uh, red. And then the orange stuff is basically regions where activity was synchronous with the seed region, the hippocampus here in red. So all this orange stuff, this is all part of the same network, this hippocampal network. Now what we found with psilocybin, which is really quite a dramatic result, I wasn't really expecting this, but when I saw it, it made a lot of sense. 
So we saw that the regions that were falling out of connectivity or falling out of sync with the hippocampus were precisely the major nodes of the default mode network, these cortical nodes of the default mode network, the medial prefrontal cortex, comprehensively in the posterior cingulate cortex and in, in these lateral parietal regions. Now, one inference that I'm, I'd be making about this result is that if the default mode network is the ego and there's a uh, disconnect between the subcortical regions that belong to the default mode network and its high level cortical regions, then this may explain some of the sort of disintegration of the ego that people describe as psychedelics. And also, when that happens, that people have sometimes some uh, vivid autobiographical recollections. We know that the hippocampi are associated with autobiographical recollection. So if you lose the top-down constraint, the, the top-down inhibiting influence of the high-level cortical regions on these key uh, subcortical regions concerned with memory and uh, you know, one's own story or one's own narrative, then it makes sense that people could have these kind of vivid autobiographical re recollections and these, these major insights that under normal waking consciousness are usually kept from consciousness because of the constraining influence of the high-level default mode network regions. Now we know that there's a relationship between how often people uh, fall out of the moment, you know, fall out of the here and now and daydream about their past or start thinking about the future. So when people do that, there's a positive relationship between that uh, cognitive act, I suppose, and connectivity between the hippocampal regions and the default mode network regions. So again, you might interpret this result as, as kind of um, a loss of that kind of falling out of the moment and daydreaming about the, the past and the future. Uh, what else have we found in terms of looking at brain networks and changes in connectivity? Well, these are uh, two different seeds. We've got a red one in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and here's the default mode network, which belongs to this region. And here we, we looked at what's referred to as the attention network or a task positive network and uh, regions here, we've got superior parietal regions in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So here we're, we're asking, you know, we've got two essentially very different networks, one concerned with introspection and the sense of self, the default mode network, and one concerned with scrutinizing the external world and engaging in, in um, sort of executive function. And then we're looking at how psilocybin affects these networks. And what we found was both networks uh, essentially uh, disintegrate or there's a, a decrease in, in integration of the regions that belong to these networks under psilocybin. So it's an effect that's not just confined to the default mode network. We're seeing that a number of different functional brain networks, major uh, high level brain networks are becoming essentially disintegrated under psilocybin. Now, our, mo our more recent study has really been helpful personally for understanding how these drugs work in the brain. Uh, functional magnet magnetic resonance imaging, a limitation of it is that you're making inferences about brain activity through blood flow. And so there could be changes in blood flow caused by a drug uh, which don't necessarily map onto changes in brain activity. Now, with magnetoencephalography, you become much closer to the oscillations in brain activity that are, are truly going on, you know, so it's a more direct measure of brain activity. So in this study, we looked at uh, brain activity in 15 healthy volunteers, a similar design to the fMRI study. We had a, a 10 minute, actually an 11 minute resting state scan with a five minute baseline and a one minute infusion period with the same dose, two milligrams and then five minutes post-drug, and this is resting state again, so they're just relaxing and looking at a, a little dot on the screen. So again, what, what were the first observations? Well, these are the, the subjective effects. Um, there's a lot to read here, but I just want to emphasize that the primary effects were per, uh, perceptual, uh, but most of these items um, were significantly higher under psilocybin than placebo, but two items that I particularly want to draw your attention to are these here, so one of them, says the experience had a supernatural quality, so appealing to kind of mit, uh, magical or metaphysical thinking. And the other one is I experienced a disintegration of myself or ego. And the reason why I highlighted those will become obvious in a moment. First of all, what did we find in terms of the oscillations in cortical activity in the brain after psilocybin? 
So supporting our results with fMRI, we found that uh, the, essentially this is a, a measure of the amplitude of oscillations in the brain. So the brain uh, in normal waking consciousness is organized in this uh, highly organized rhythmic way. There's different um, frequency bands where you see uh, a lot of synchronous activity. And the brain has this kind of sort of synchronous, organized rhythmic structure to it. What we found with psilocybin was th that rhythmic structure essentially profoundly collapsed under psilocybin. So across the frequency range from very slow oscillations to the very fast oscillations in the brain, we, s we found a decrease in this rhythmic structure. So activity was essentially becoming disorganized, desynchronous, and that uh, organized nature of brain activity was, uh, was really quite profoundly collapsed under the drug. So what does that mean functionally? Well, first of all, we found that some of the decreases were uh, highly consistent spatially uh, with our fMRI results, particularly these posterior cingulate decreases in the alpha frequency band. So from that, we looked at correlations with the subjective effects. And so looking within the posterior cingulate cortex and plotting out the decreases in, in alpha um, power or, or amplitude, we found that there was this very striking, uh, highly significant positive correlation between the magnitude of the decreases in alpha power or the magnitude of the collapse in, in the rhythmicity in this frequency band correlated um, very significantly with scores on this item. I experienced a disintegration of myself or ego. So for me, this is, for me, this is the most, you know, uh, interesting finding of the lot, really, you know, that this relationship was so strong uh, and it's such a um, sort of cardinal um, property of the psychedelic experience and something which ranges uh, incredibly, you know, there's a lot of variance in this, in this effect and it's a very sort of dose sensitive uh, effect, you know, with higher doses you'll see this thing described as ego disintegration but with lower doses, you don't so much. We, we found that those people who, who really described this and rated it high uh, were seeing, it was in those individuals that we were seeing these very marked decreases in alpha power. So it's, it's at this level that we can make a really, I think, genuine mapping between the phenomenology of the psychedelic state, which a lot of us know is incredibly profound and, and sometimes um, you know, quite earth-shattering, uh, and what and and uh, changes in brain activity that we're identifying with neuroimaging. So for me, you know, in terms of Freud talked about uh, the discovery of of the unconscious mind and 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 its uh, differentiation from the ego as being a kind of narcissistic blow. You know, that we that there's a realization with that that we're not really masters of our own house. You know, that there are unconscious forces going on in us that influence our behavior and our thinking. Well, for me, this is a kind of narcissistic blow as well, because what we're discovering is that our sense of self, you know, that thing that we all have, that perennial sense of being someone, someone, you know, uh, that, that sort of exists absolutely, really is, an, is, is kind of an illusion because it's based on brain activity. So all, all we are is a product of our brain activity. For me, that's quite a profound realization. Uh, another item which, which uh, showed this um, highly significant uh, relationship between drops in alpha power was this item, the experience had a supernatural quality. For me, this is intriguing as well, that these two experiences, which are kind of complementary, uh, the loss of ego and then the onset of kind of magical thinking, uh, supernatural thinking, um, both of these items uh, were the ones that correlated most strongly uh, with the drops in alpha power that we were seeing with psilocybin. So it helps to understand the phenomenology as well, that when you lose the ego and you have this kind of onset of, of kind of magical thinking, uh, it gives you a sense of what the ego does, you know, it keeps us constrained to reality, that we reality test with a kind of uh, diligence, you know, um, Whereas when that drops away, we can be more kind of fantasy-based in our thinking and sometimes hold uh, sort of fallacious beliefs about the world. You know, we may have wishful beliefs or we may have paranoid beliefs. 
if we lose the function of the ego. So another quite sophisticated analysis that we did uh, on the MEG data was this modeling approach which looked at the contribution of different cel cellular layers in the cortex to the signal that we were seeing, the changes in the signal that we were seeing with uh, psilocybin and, and, and magnetoencephalography. So with this analysis, we found that it was actually these deep layer pyramidal neurons, the ones that express serotonin 2A receptors most highly, that were most significantly affected by psilocybin and that most contributed to those drops in um, spectral power that I was just showing, you know. Um, so that's really quite intriguing because it, it fits the puzzle so neatly, you know, that this is these deep layer pyramidal neurons are where the serotonin 2A receptors are most densely expressed. And they're also, with this modeling approach, the ones that are coming out as being affected by the drug. And they were affected in the direction of becoming more excitable. Uh, so they were be becoming more likely to fire as a result of um, psilocybin. So it's intriguing that a cell type can become more excitable, yet we're observing these net decreases in uh, brain activity, if you like, brain blood flow, brain connectivity, oscillatory power. So it helps um, kind of address some of the uh, points of confusion that have, have come up through looking at the neuroscience of how these drugs work in the brain, that you can have an increase in excitation in a, in a particular cell group, which kind of translates into a net decrease in brain activity. Now we know that the brain has this hierarchical organization. So for instance, the uh, primary visual cortex is concerned with quite low level things in the visual field, such as edges, contour, uh, this kind of thing. And high level up in the, in the uh, cortex as we move up the visual stream, we have regions which are concerned with more um, abstract phenomena such as faces or objects. Uh, so the brain has this very neat uh, hierarchical organization and that's particularly exemplified in the visual system. Now in a particular model of how the brain works essentially or a model of global brain function, uh, now this is something that you might want to look up because it's hard stuff but uh, it's important. So in this model of how the brain works, it's these deep layer pyramidal neurons, these layer five neurons that do the uh, kind of top-down inference. So their, their activity in these regions is thought to encode internal representations of the world. You know, this is one of the myths that people have about psychedelics sometimes, that they'll see geometric patterns, for instance, and they'll believe that they're actually out there, you know, that they're seeing some other aspects of reality. When uh, really based on what we know about the brain, what, what, what's being perceived is the brain's own spontaneous activity, internal representations which are usually latent, which are now becoming manifest under the drug. So it's intriguing that we saw excitation in these particular units in the cortex, which are the bits that do the inference, the bits that do the predicting, the top-down predicting. So that again fits, you know, that's a very sort of a neat, neat sort of slotting in into the puzzle. If you want to try and understand this prediction coding model of how the brain works, then the best reference to go to would be Carl Friston's uh, free energy principle. Um, it's, it's difficult, but you know, the brain's pretty difficult. Um, but it's, uh, if, you, if you're serious about trying to understand this stuff, then I'd, I'd definitely direct you to that. Well, this uh, principle fits very nicely with the, the word itself, you know, psychedelic comes from the Greek for uh, um, soul, really. The, that's the most accurate translation. Psyche means soul. And uh, Delice, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, um, translates as to make visible or clear. So we're looking at drugs that make manifest the mind's latent processes. You know, it's inherent in the name how these drugs work mechanistically. Um, you know, an example is like, for instance, how we would see uh, faces in, in trees, for instance, you know, so here we're seeing internal models which are held in the brain. Humans are very sort of primed uh, to, to see faces, you know, and so under the conditions of a psychedelic drug, there's this kind of impetuous inference, if you like, or this uh, inference before evidence, you know, where we're making predictions before the evidence comes in to truly call up that prediction. So it really helps to explain a lot of the phenomenology of the psychedelic state, that internal representations that we hold in our heads, in our brains, become manifest via the action of the drug. Uh, 
probably through excitation of these deep layer pyramidal neurons. Now, a very deep and, and abstract problem uh, in terms of the phenomenology of psychedelic drugs is the, um, the spiritual experiences that people can have on them. Now, I've, I've recently become very interested in reading about the phenomenology, and I, it, 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 I read William James's book, uh, you know, many years ago, but uh, I more recently uh, read the work of um, Wilfred uh, Stace. Uh, I know Roland's talked about it today. Um, and it's an incredible book, uh, trying to, in a systematic way, look at the core features of the spiritual experience. And the core feature that he identifies is this unitive experience, what he refers to as uh, unitive consciousness. And it's really a appealing to that sense of oneness that people have on psychedelics. So it's the kind of thing that people think, you know, they get so uh, sort of in awe of that they think, oh, these drugs do something which is beyond what we know about the physics of the world. They're sort of appealing to something metaphysical. You know, being a scientist, I don't believe that. And I think that there are changes in brain activity which can explain these experiences, however profound they are, you know. And for me, kind of getting a grip on, on what these processes are is equally profound. I don't think you lose any of the magic of the experience or the wonder of the experience by trying to understand uh, how they work in the brain. So that's what uh, I've been thinking about quite recently. So some, some subjective reports which appeal to this experience. Uh, this is from our own work. We had one volunteer saying, that was real ego death stuff, a total dissolving of the ego boundaries. I only existed as a concept or as an idea. Uh, this volunteer said, it was certainly quite difficult at times to know where I ended and where I melted into everything around me. Uh, this volunteer said, uh, this is from Roland Griffith's work, he said, uh, the feeling of no boundaries, I did not know where I ended uh, and my surroundings began. Somehow I was able to comprehend what oneness is. So we know that brain networks have, some certain brain networks have this um, competitive relationship and their function is competitive, this is important. So we have a brain network here, the default mode network, which is concerned with uh, self-referencing, with a sense of self, looking inwards. It's, it's kind of concerned with self-subject and um, sort of internal, you could say. And then we have this TUS positive network, which is concerned with object, external, uh, and other, you could say. And we see that the activity in these uh, networks is competitive. As one goes up, the other goes down. And that really mirrors what happens during normal waking consciousness when we're either thinking about ourselves or daydreaming or out of the moment, uh, you know, thinking about the future or the past, that would be internal, that would be self, that would be subject, or engaging it in the external world and thinking about, uh, you know, uh, something very specific in the here and now. So what happens under psilocybin? Well, we see a collapse in this competitive relationship between the, net, the two networks. So rather than being uh, kind of either or or sort of uh, winner takes all, uh, they become essentially one, they become the same network, they blend together and there's no differentiation. So the idea that I've submitted in a, in a recent article is that uh, this underlies the loss of subject-object differentiation, you know. It's really quite a simple principle and it makes a lot of sense, at least to me, you know, that if you see a collapse in the uh, competitive uh, relationship between these networks and they become blended essentially into the same thing, then you're not going to have that duality. No longer can you have self and other if there isn't anything for self and other to rest on. You know, they become the same thing. So where else do you see this? Well, you see it in schizophrenia, you see it in early psychosis particularly. So in terms of the problem of how psychedelics and the phenomenology of this state maps onto psychosis, uh, really, it's a very specific aspect of psychosis where the mapping is most genuine. And that's in early psychosis, before there's a kind of fixed nature to consciousness um, or to cognition, that people have delusions and they get very sort of rigid in their belief systems. But in this early sort of loose state, that's where the mapping is most genuine. So it's interesting that there is this same decrease in the um, competitive relationship between the networks in early psychosis. Also in deep meditation, and particularly this form of meditation referred to as non-dual awareness, which promotes this loss of self-object differentiation. So here's the hypothesis that I proposed in an article. I need to rush slightly because I don't have much time left. 
But here's a very recent finding that we've uh, found with um, looking at the stability of brain networks over time. So uh, this looks at how networks kind of come into and then fall out of existence. Uh, so it's a measure of kind of the permanence of a network. What we found was that um, these high-level brain networks, these frontoparietal networks, uh, their internal um, integrity uh, basically varied very much over time. So they would come into existence and then fall out. So they wouldn't really have any permanence. And for me, this might map onto some of the kind of fluid uh, quality of cognition in the psychedelic state. Now here's a summary slide to help kind of uh, you know, reinforce in your minds what, what we found so far with our fMRI and MEG work and psilocybin. So we found decreased blood flow in the, main, in the brain's main transit hubs or integration centers. We've also found decreased integrity in key brain networks. We found collapsed rhythmic structure of cortical brain activity in very similar regions that we saw the effects with fMRI. We've seen uh, a, a hyperexcitation of the brain's prediction units, and I've submitted the idea that this, this may cause some of the kind of false inference that you see in the psychedelic state, or seeing faces in trees, for instance. And we've seen a collapse in the normally competitive relationship between brain networks concerned with the self and brain networks concerned with scrutinizing the external world. Uh, we've also seen that brain networks become more fleeting or less permanent in their uh, connectivity. Now, a general principle which may explain all of this stuff uh, is the uh, metric of entropy or the measure of order or disorder. So the idea I want to submit is that on this kind of um, dimension of entropy, this, this sort of dimension of order essentially, there's a kind of sweet spot. So uh, these are ideas that are talked, to, talked about a lot at the moment in cognitive neuroscience and systems neuroscience. There's a kind of perfect place, uh, there's a perfect balance between kind of formlessness or complete disorder and complete uh, stability, but so stability to the extent or order to the extent that the system then becomes inflexible. So for consciousness to be poised in this kind of optimal place where we can scrutinize the world in the best way, uh, learn the, uh, you know, the nature of the world uh, um, in the most optimal way and yet retain flexibility given that the world is changeable, then there's a kind of sweet spot where the system has to be, where it's perfectly balanced between disorder and order. And so this would be normal waking consciousness. So I'm sure you probably all guessed where the psychedelic state might be on this trajectory, and it's over to the left. Uh, so some states which share a phenomenology with the psychedelic state, which probably also show uh, this um, sort of increase in, in disorder in the parameters that define uh, uh, the activity which underlies the states. REM sleep dreaming, early psychosis, the sensory deprived state, deep meditatory states such as this non-dual awareness, the near-death experience and the psychedelic state. So states which may kind of veer to the right and become too stable, too rigid, so that the kind of flexible quality of consciousness is lost would be seizure for instance. So people tend to think that as a, think of that as a chaotic state, but that's misleading, it's not chaotic. There's very synchronous activity in the brain in seizure, so it is a too organized state. There's too much order to such an extent that there's no flexibility and one loses consciousness. Sedation, again, a very highly synchronous state, deep sleep, and depression is probably over on this side as well, a too fixed, a too ordered state. So this should give you a feel for uh, kind of what, uh, how brain activity maps onto different conscious states. So a metaphor for mind expansion. Some of this stuff might, people might read as being somehow, I don't know, when people are so sort of enamored by the psychedelic experience, they prefer not to think of it as a kind of chaos in the brain. Um, uh, and I, I don't really present this to make people feel better. I just think that this helps explain um, the principles here. So this principle of entropy, you know, it, it's a very intriguing metric because it makes sense in a, both a um, sort of qualitative way, uh, a measure of, of order and disorder, but it also makes sense on an information level because in information theory, entropy is synonymous with uh, 
uh, uncertainty. So here's an example. In this top uh, row, we have a uh, high order, we have a constraint there, and the system is uh, all the particles in the system are confined to this compartment. Now, if we were to make a prediction about the spatial location of any particular particle, we could do so with high certainty. We would know that the probability of a particle being in the left side is it's certain, we know it's going to be there, there's a constraint, it has to be there. Now if we remove that constraint and the particles can go anywhere, we lose our confidence about where a particular particle might be in the system. So this is a, a metaphor, this metaphor of increasing entropy helps, under, helps us understand the phenomenology of the state. So other sy uh, synonyms or um, alternative terms for entropy that are used uh, in, in mathematics or in physics of freedom, disorder, and uncertainty. So all these things are increased and a, a metaphor. So if there's something for you to take home, if you don't understand the neuroscience, but you want to understand the principles, then this is an important slide really, you know, that a metaphor for the psychedelic state is one of increasing entropy or entropy increasing. Um, and the expansion of a gas is maybe a useful uh, metaphor for understanding what's going on in terms of the mechanics of the brain. It's also worth thinking that arguably the most fundamental principle in physics, this uh, second law of thermodynamics, that systems kind of left to themselves will show increasing entropy. You know, so when systems die, when, they, uh, when they're not driven, they move towards disorder. It's intriguing to think in, in terms of the overlaps between the near-death experience, for instance, and the psychedelic state that somehow, you know, there's a kind of, we're seeing the principle of the second law of thermodynamics, that there's a kind of model in a way of brain death with a psychedelic state. What about MDMA? <laughs> I don't really have any time, but I've only got two slides. Well, it's a potent serotonin uh, releaser along with uh, other neurotransmitters. This is a study in 25 healthy volunteers, double blind, placebo controlled. We gave 100 milligrams of MDMA. Uh, 60 minute scans and the results I want to show you very quickly are, are things that Amanda talked about actually um, so I'll just go over them very quickly but we had volunteers remember their very favorite memories so for instance things like remember the beach in uh, California or something like that uh, and also their very worst memories so for instance you know remember the crash in uh, London <laughs> Uh, and so they would, uh, they would remember these memories in the scanner and then we would take ratings of the subjective experience and on MDMA people rated their memories as being much more emotional, highly significant changes here, much more emotional, much more vivid, and much more positive. What about the worst memories? Well they were slightly more positive but still not very positive but slightly more uh, and at a trend level um, a little less negative. What about the brain effects? Well we found a boosting of activity. We're looking here at the favorite memories. Uh, in the anterior temporal cortex, we saw a boosting of, of the brain's response during recollection of their favorite memories in this region. What about for the worst memories? In these temporal cortical regions, we saw a suppression of the response to their worst memories uh, under MDMA. What does this mean functionally? Well, we know that we found this positive correlation between the right temporal pole responses uh, to all of the memories and the strength of the emotion. You can see that this is the same region where we saw the boosts with MDMA. So more emotion, more positive emotion, and a boosted response in this region. What about the, well, some subjective reports, just one here on the drug, the good memories were more intense and especially made me feel more positive memories. And the very last slide, this is showing the relationship between responses in the left temporal cortex here, quite proximal to the amygdala. The bigger the response there, the more negative were their emotional responses to the bad memories, as you can see here. You know, more under placebo, bigger response, suppressed by MDMA, and if this is low here, then the, the memories are less negative. So this maps quite, on, uh, quite nicely onto the phenomenology. These are two reports here. The bad memories were less salient under MDMA, and I thought about them in a matter-of-fact way. And when I reached back for the memories under MDMA, they didn't seem as bad. Uh, uh, in fact, I saw them as fatalistic necessities for the occurrence of the later good events. Uh, so it's, it's, again, providing you know, a sense for what's going on in terms of the phenomenology based on our understanding of 
of brain activity under these different drugs. And with that, I'll close and thank David Nutt especially. He's been my mentor for the last uh, eight years or so, and he's, he's an incredible guy, and he's going to be talking to you next. Amanda Fielding, who's been just a, a real stalwart throughout everything. Um, incredible support, um, both intellectually um, and in general from Amanda. Uh, the Medical Research Council, Hefter Institute for their support of our scanning and also maps as well. And, so, and just to end to say thank, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. So we have some time for questions. So um, near-death experiences and perhaps psychedelic experiences uh, suggest brain failure in some way. And <clears throat> one of the aspects of brain failure might be the failure to discriminate between objects. And I wondered if this unitive experience could be quantitated by studies on discrimination. That's a very interesting idea, yeah. I mean, Stace talked about a collapse of the multiplicity of our experience of the world so that we can identify very specific things nor, nor, during normal waking consciousness, but that collapses in the psychedelic state and things lose their kind of sort of distinctness. You know, that applies in terms of self and other, but it applies also in terms of just the range and repertoire of objects in our environment, for instance. So an interesting idea, and there are uh, useful paradigms for looking at discrimination. So yeah, uh, very interesting and worth looking at, thanks. I was just wondering if um, you did any follow-up uh, brain scans um, to see if there's any difference in functional connectivity uh, maybe a few weeks after the initial uh, psilocybin yeah. dose. Again, a really good question. We didn't um, do uh, sort of subacute effects. We didn't look at subacute effects in this study, but we will in future studies, so we'll address that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Robin. Um, wandering around this conference, I'm led to believe by lots of presentations that consciousness exists outside the brain. Um, it sounds like you're saying something quite different. We haven't found any evidence, and science has never found any evidence that consciousness exists anywhere else but via its generation in brain activity. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. It was so exciting. I could hardly sit in my seat. Um, anyway, I was interested in what um, computational models you're using for both your high-level neural networks and your low-level neural networks. So, for example, are you using um, like supervised learning for recognizing default mode networks, and also are you using maybe like back propagation models for the low level, like just if you could point me in the direction. Yeah, of so the, the modeling is uh, dynamic causal modeling. Um, so it's a method uh, developed by Carl Friston at the um, Wellcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging in London. Uh, I wish I understood it better, basically. So um, I don't really know how it works, um, but it's a modeling based on the changes in the spectral uh, properties um, with the drug. Beyond that, I don't really understand it. I wish I did. Do you have any references in your papers that I could? Uh, I, yes, in, in a forthcoming paper, it's um, in hopefully in the latter stages of review. We had one glowing review of the MEG study and then one uh, critical review, but uh, I think we've addressed that. They'll be coming out quite soon and it'll be thoroughly referenced. Right. Dynamic causal modeling is right. uh, what we used. On a few of your slides, you mentioned oh, on a few of your slides you mentioned um, that there was a certain uh, neural activity pattern that was correlated with early psychosis or people at risk for psychosis. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that, and um, is there a clear enough correlation that it could be used as a screening technique? A, sc a screening technique uh, for people who are at risk to develop psychosis oh, to guide yes. courses of treatment. Yes, uh, well, a really good question. That's a kind of holy grail at the moment. People are looking for these markers of you know, potential conversion to psychosis. This might be one of them. I really do think it might be. Uh, it maps on very neatly, at least theoretically, with the phenomenology. Uh, the the sort of next stage is to look at its selectivity or specificity for the phenomenology that I'm kind of linking it to, you know, this loss of ego boundaries. Potentially, it could be a marker. And if it is, then that would be great, you know, because we could then look at uh, preventative treatments to try and avoid a conversion to psychosis. Thank you. Hi, I had a quick question about the difference in um, between your experimental setup uh, with injecting the volunteers with uh, psilocybin versus ingesting uh, 
psilocybin containing mushrooms. Um, as far as uh, ingesting them, I think as soon as uh, uh, they reach the acidic uh, uh, environment of your stomach, it converts to psilocin and then reaches its way up to your brain. Um, so what do you think between the difference between uh, eventually the psilocybin being converted to psilocin and you injecting the volunteers with psilocybin? Yeah. Well, it, the onset of the effects are so rapid, it probably gets broken down in the blood. Um, there's, there's probably enzymes in the blood that are converting it. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to do um, this imaging work with orally administered uh, psychedelics. I tend to think that it will find exactly the same thing, um, but that's you know yet to be done, uh, at least with the modalities that we've used. Although an ayahuasca study uh, was presented team from Brazil which found it entirely consistent things, decreases in default mode network connectivity with ayahuasca. I think I'm, I'm confident in this stuff, you know, we found replication after replication with our own work. The real test is if other teams find the same thing. All right, well, thank you. With your fMRI data, have you done some independent component analysis to look at the resting state networks of the brain on psilocybin, how these spatial maps might differ from controls? Yeah, we have, yeah. So some of the, so the between network coupling, we identified those networks doing independent component analysis. Um, and there's also the dual regression approach where you find the networks and then you look at, um, you use those networks as kind of seeds, you know. So how I was using the hippocampus as a seed and then looking at changes, we'd use the whole network and then look at changes. So yeah, we have done that and it's, it's a really useful technique. Hi, Robin. Um, when you, uh, you, you speculate about the ego and uh, how the ego is sort of the function of the default mode network. Um, and that just led me to wonder how people having subjective experiences that they can later relate, you know, because they express from the point of view of an identity. Um, and so where is the identity that is uh, saying, I had a an experience of um, being dissociated, or I had, you know, people describing from maybe not the ego, but there's some form of identity. So is there, well, do you have any more I any I imagine the, the kind of increased entropy that you see in the state acutely returns to some kind of normality with com coming down from the drug, you know, and with a return mostly to normal waking consciousness, albeit with some residual effects. I wonder if the return to the order that you had prior to the drug is quite achieved, uh, you know, in, in coming down. Because, I mean, if, if, you, if you retain some flexibility, then that might ex explain some of the lasting effects that you see with psychedelics. Thank you. So, a quick follow-up. Is, is that sort of implies that maybe the memories that people are reporting are kind of constructed during the come down or some part of the come down as opposed to at the peak of the experiment is that what you're I think, uh, probably only with say? an incredibly high dose did you have dissociation to such an extent that people forget what happened during the experience um, when people talk about you know extreme very high dose heroic experiences with, with psychedelics so much so that they have um, amnesia about the experience uh, generally, uh, that probably doesn't happen that much. It only happens with very high doses. Well, thank you so much for that. Please help me thank Dr. Carthard Harris, and we're going to turn the floor over to Amanda Fielding to introduce our next speaker.